Well, it's good to good to see each one of you tonight, and uh, do have a, a few announcements to make uh, coming up on uh, well next week, July the fourth. We'll have uh, regular service at eleven uh, ten fifty, and then again at six o'clock, and then uh, of course Wednesday night, both Wednesday nights, uh, this coming Wednesday night and Wednesday night after the fourth at seven o'clock and then starting on july the 11th we'll have sunday school at 10 uh worship service at 10 50 and then the regular sunday night service wednesday night service uh so uh folks on facebook at tune in uh we probably ain't gonna be on at 11 o'clock it may be 11 22 11 23 11 33 but we'll be on Sometime another on July the 11th the mor for the morning service after the song service is over. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. We'll be in uh, Acts chapter 2 tonight. And uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to be gathered in your house with your people once again. And we lift up these, Lord, we mentioned this morning for prayer. And in addition to those this morning we want to continue to remember brother tommy rupel and his battle with uh cancer and uh lord we just lift up him and miss Teresa and their whole family and uh, all the doctors and nurses to be tending to him and uh lord we we thank you for uh taking care of uh, him and uh these others that we've mentioned today and uh lord uh I just ask that you be with us, Lord, as we look to your word tonight. Show us the things that we stand in need of to draw us as Christians closer to you. And also, if there be one lost and undone without you that listens to us tonight, Lord, we, we pray that uh, they'd be saved before it's everlasting too late. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, we're seeing a few people joining us. I saw one name pop up there that I didn't, uh, I don't know, but we want to welcome everybody that's online tonight uh, that joined in with us. Uh, Acts chapter 2, we'll read verses 37 through 40. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So let's look back to, to verse 37. They came at, at the conclusion of his sermon there in verse number 36. Uh, they came under conviction. And uh, what, just to refresh everybody's memory about Conviction. Conviction is a is an emotional move, moment movement of the heart. A person senses sorrow over disappointing God. The person's heart is touched and moved to some degree of brokenness. Conviction is being picked with a pricked with a tug, a pull, a knowledge, and awareness. Now, what I used to explain it as and still do on, on occasion y'all have probably heard me say that say this is uh when i was in school there were often times when i'd get butterflies in my stomach uh when something big something important was approaching and uh, that usually involved a test uh and if i hadn't studied for that test then butterflies really showed up then uh, I remember when I was in the ninth grade, uh, our first basketball game of the year, and uh, I don't know if I've, I think, uh, I don't know if I've shared this with you or not, but uh, if it was this day and time and folks found out what I was doing, I'd have been sent to the house because I spent the day throwing up because I was nervous. Butterflies was all over me that day. 
And if somebody probably would have found out that day, I'd probably been sent to the house. But they didn't find out. And probably now, if they lift in, they find it out. We should have sent you home way back then. But anyway, uh, that's what I also experienced when the Holy Spirit got a hold of me saying, Marty, it's time to be saved. And uh, so much the more when the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. Uh, but... A group of writers says it's a, it's a sense of sin, being convicted, doing wrong, or breaking God's law, or being disobedient. It's a sense of failure, of coming short, of not measuring up, of disappointing God. It is a sense of needing more and more of the Lord and his righteousness. And they asked the question, what shall we do? Now, if folks that come under conviction, if, what, if they'd only ask that, what shall we do? Instead of like Marty did when, he was coming, when I was under conviction to be saved, uh, I'll do it next week. I'll do it tonight. I'll do it later on. No, they wanted to know right then, right now, what shall we do? I'm thankful that that day they had some folks there that uh, knew what to tell them. Now, uh, what if somebody comes up to us under conviction and they say, what shall we do? What do I need to do? Are we going to be able to tell them? If you look over with me to Acts chapter 16, uh, verse number 30 is where we're going to Start reading that, and I'll try to lead you into what verse 30 says here. Uh, Paul and Silas had been thrown in, had been beaten, put in jail. He'd put, uh, the jailer had put them in the inner prison, and uh, they began singing praises at midnight. And the uh, earthquake, the Lord sent an earthquake, opened up all the doors, loosed all the chains, all the bands that they were bound with. And the jailer wakes up thinking everybody's done gone. And... Peter, he's drawn out a sword, fixing to kill himself. And Peter says, do yourself no harm, we're all here. And that's where we got uh, to verse 30. He came in and got Paul and Silas and brought them out in verse 30 and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I've shared this with you before. It's uh, There's nothing glad, nothing happy about this story. Uh, Brother Butler is one that shared this with me, shared it with the congregation there at Good Springs. This fella in Athens was hit by a train and he lay there dying. And a group of folks gathered around. Don't know how many was there, but the way Brother Butler talked, there was a good number of folks there uh, I'm just going to venture out on a limb. At least some of them probably went to the church house. And that man died voicing these words. Does anybody here know how I can be saved? Does anybody know what to tell me of how to be saved? And he drew his last breath. And nobody there was able to tell him. It's very important that you and I, as children of God, know, first of all, that we are saved, know what we believe, and know how, when that question arises, what to say. We can point them to Scripture and let them know what to say. So uh, this jailer here, kind of like the group of folks over in Acts chapter 2, says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And verse 31, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spoke unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in the house, he took them that same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. 
Fellers, that speaks a whole lot of when the man of the house gets right, the whole house gets right. That speaks a lot of his leadership. And they must have known that right from the beginning because they said to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 31, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. If you'll look back with me to Acts chapter 2. So they came to the Peter and the rest of the apostles and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And I ask you again, if that question's posed to each one of us, are we going to know what to say? Are we going to know what Romans 10 verse 9 says? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart as God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Are we going to know what Acts 2.38 says? You need to repent. You say, what, what does the word repent mean? That means to turn from something. In this case, it's turned from sin to the Lord. Now he says there in verse 38, Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's two commands there in that verse that must be done. The first one is you need to repent. Turn over with me to Mark chapter number 16. And I know that some of y'all, if you've got a different translation of the Bible than the King James Version, you've got this either in the footnotes. You've got a footnote somewhere. Even in my Schofield Bible, there's a uh, note down here about this. That uh, Here's what the, King James, the Schofield Bible says. The passage from, in Mark 16, the passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts. And others have it with partial omissions and variations. But it is in, quoted by a couple different fellers in the 2nd or 3rd century. So here it is in the King James Version. In other words... In some of the older manuscripts, it ended at verse what we know as verse number 9. But I want you to look. Mark 16, verse number 15. This is the Mark's version of the Great Commission. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and I'm, I'm going to make that, try to make that plain again. It does not say, go ye into part of the world. Go ye into the part that you know, that you're comfortable with, that you feel like you'll be accepted by. But it says, go ye into all the world. Folks that have different colored skin need to hear the gospel. Folks that speak a different language needs to hear the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to those ye like. No, that ain't what it says. To those with the same color, color skin you got. No, that ain't what it says. Preach the gospel to every creature. Preach it to all. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I, I believe this fully that you and I can know that we know that we know that salvation is ours today. But on the other hand, there comes a time in our life that if we're lost, we need to realize, realize this, that I'm lost. If you'll turn over with me to John chapter 3, and we'll read, start reading in verse 18. Don't know how far down through there we'll go, but we'll start in verse 18. 
We talked about verse 16, I believe, this morning. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. He that, I'm going to say this, he that believes on him has put their faith and trust in him, they're saved. They've been born again. But look what the rest of that verse says. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Uh, we won't turn over there, but I just want to remind you about part of what verse First John three twenty four says that we know that we're His by the Spirit that He gives us. Now this morning we talked a little bit about that. How will rivers of joy flow from our belly? Flow from our innermost being? Wells of living water spring up within us. How will that happen? It's through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. So uh, he that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. J. Burnham McGee comment on verse number 38, part of it, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing, says this. Now, I want to remind you that Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Water baptism would be the evidence that they had repented. Now, I know there are some that say, I'm saved, but I ain't never been baptized. Well, let me tell you this. To be in God's will, the first step, is to be in a relationship with him. And to be in a relationship with him, I hope you agree with me that we're going to follow what his word says. So if we're going to follow what his word says, then after we put our faith and trust in him, one of the first things that we need to do to be where we need to be is to be baptized to show forth to the world what's already happened on the inside. So J. Vernon McGee says water baptism would be the evidence that they had repented, that they had come to Christ and had put their trust in him. Peter says to them, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. This will be an evidence that you have trusted him for the remission of your sins, rather than bringing sacrifice to be offered in the temple. You see that your, their baptism would be a testimony to the fact that Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So is baptism important? Amen. It is important. Turn over with me to Romans chapter 6. Verse 3 and 4. I, I don't believe that we'll ever be in a place of what you might call satisfaction in our life, in our relationship with the Lord, until we have experienced baptism, water baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit takes place at the moment of salvation. But look at Romans 6, verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, in verse 4, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So that's the picture of what water baptism is. Buried in a watery grave and raised to walk in a newness of life. Expressing to the world, and most of the time it's expressing to our brothers and sisters in Christ that are members of the church that we are attending, expressing to them what has already taken place in our life as a child of God. If you look back to Acts 2, verse 38, I want to talk to you about uh, a little bit about remission of sins. Uh, that word remission means just simply to send off, to send away, the wrong is cut out, sent off, sent away, from the wrongdoer. The sin is separated from the sinner. And here's something that should make us rejoice. There's an idea along with this that it's a once for all forgiveness, a total forgiveness. Man is forgiven once and for all when he receives Jesus Christ as his Savior. Belief in Christ which includes true repentance, is the only condition for being forgiven once and for all. And one place we want to turn is Isaiah chapter 44, verse number 22. If you've got something to mark with, that's going to be a pretty good verse to mark in some way. If you've got a highlighter, I suggest you highlight it. I'm putting an asterisk by mine. You can uh, underline it. But if you don't like marking any Bible, write it down somewhere. Isaiah 44 and verse number 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. Amen. And as a cloud thy sins. So I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Forgiveness, forgiveness maintains fellowship. It releases guilt. Remission of sins. Repent and be baptized every one of you, for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Now, I want to remind you from this morning what we read in John chapter 7. You don't have to turn there. I just want to remind you, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost has not yet been given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But when we put our faith and trust in him, we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit comes and makes his abode with us. Now let's look at verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children. Now, I'm going to remind you about who he's talking to on that day. He's talking to a room full of Jewish people. And he tells them that this promise is unto you and unto your children. You say, well, where did we come in at? Well, let's, let's, let's just don't put a period there. Let's keep reading. Verse 39. And to all that are far off. Amen. He threw us in there, didn't he? Threw the Gentiles in there. And here's something very important. This last part of verse 39. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
there's got to be a call on us first. We've got to realize our lostness. We've got to be convicted of our sin. Uh, when he talks about in John 16 of the Holy Spirit coming, the Comforter coming, one of the things that uh, he will convict the world of, or the King James Version says reprove the world of, is sin. The sin of unbelief of righteousness, of righteousness because Jesus said, I go to the Father, and of judgment, of judgment because the prince of this world, Satan himself, has already been judged. He wants to prevent that call from happening. He wants to prevent that call from being answered. But in order to be saved, God's got to call him. Now, here's a list here that some fellers has put together. A man does not act alone and come to Christ. A man does not come by his own effort and energy. A man does not come by his own works. A man does not come by his own mind, thoughts, and will. A man does not come by his own labor and good deeds. A man who is a dead spirit can do nothing spiritually just as a dead man can do nothing physically, if a man with a dead spirit is to come to Christ, he has to be acted upon and drawn by God. Both God and man have a part in salvation. But know this, it's nothing that we do. It's all what Christ has done for us. Verse 40. Many other words did he testify and exhort unto them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourselves, meaning that a person is to act <coughs> and do exactly what Peter preached. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. What about this other word, untoward? You got, I don't know about y'all, but I, I don't think I've ever used that. In a classroom, I've never used that talking to anybody in general, but what does that mean? Now, I want to remind you, this is about A.D. 33. We're closing in upon this being about... 2,000 years ago. And we've been saying it's about 2,000 years ago for a lot of years. All my life I've heard it. About, it's been about 2,000 years. Well, we're getting closer to that being 2,000 years. Schofield's got it dated as A.D. 33. I think uh, Daddy this morning, he told his age 88 years. You think about the changes that he's seen in his life. I think about the changes I've seen in my life. And yet, Peter tells them on that day to save themselves from this untoward generation. I want to tell you about what some other translation of the Bible says about that. Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Be saved from this perverse generation. So let's get down to the literal meaning of that word. It means crooked or bent out of shape. Now, if things were crooked and bent out of shape in AD 33, if that was the year this is we're talking about here, my, 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 how crooked and bent out of shape things have been able to get in close to 2,000 years later. Men are far from being straight and in the shape intended by God. They are crooked and bent, unrighteous and ungodly, sinful and corrupt. You say, well, that ain't too good of a picture. Sometimes when you have time, read Romans chapter 3 that leads up to Romans 3, 23 that says that all is sinned. And when you get down there about verse 10 and start reading down through there going toward verse 23, you'll realize this, that man, we are in a mess. We're in a shape. We need a Savior. And that Savior's name 
is Jesus Christ. Repent. Be ye by what shall we do? Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are tonight. Thank you, Lord, uh, for each one, Lord, that's joined us here in person and online. You have your way in each one of our lives. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.